he goes on to say, uh, many missionaries would tell you that uh, there used to be a day and age where we went to foreign countries, but now those foreign countries are coming here to witness to us. So there's been a reversal, and that's kind of what he's getting at. He says, the center of gravity for growing Christianity has shifted from the northern hemisphere to the global south, Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Citizens of Pakistan may be more likely to encounter Korean than American missionaries today. Churches in China are now becoming sending centers for missionaries throughout the world. The students in my seminary class who came from Nigeria are often more serious about their faith and practice in the face of their native paganism than I am in the face of mine. They are evangelistic and they don't just make converts, they make disciples. Like the ancient Christians, they baptized adult converts and their children only after a lengthy period of instruction, catechesis, prayer, and wrestling with the spiritual forces that refused to surrender to Christ without a fight. They know firsthand what it means to forsake father and mother and even be persecuted by members of their own household. Upon his conversion to Christ, one friend, a former Sharia lawyer, who had witnessed and approved the execution of Christians, was given one day to leave his Islamic country to face or face beheading. His family disowned him and stayed behind. In many ways, our era is more similar to the first century context than it is to any period since the Constantinian fusion of Christ and culture and Christendom. On one hand, the gospel is spreading in many places around the world despite the imminent threat of persecution and martyrdom. On the other hand, like a lot of Christians in the first century, Roman Empire, most believers in Europe and North America face disapproval, distraction, and disbelief more than martyrdom. We are threatened more by broad cultural sentiment against strong truth claims that might upset the vague spirituality that holds the empire together than by secret police. And that's kind of where we are in our modern day culture. Um, truth is not accepted when the truth doesn't fit the particular audience, particular individual's narrative. And truth is not based on your narrative, truth is based on what is true about. And people love to have spiritual conversations. They don't want to have Jesus as the only way conversation. Please hear me on this. People will pepper you, and we live in a time where people love to talk about spiritual things, as long as they're not narrow in Christ. And this was several of the questions that the gentleman was uh, peppering me with last night. Uh, and he was quoting some well-known uh, people like Billy Graham and some others about what they were saying. And then I would show him in scripture how what they were saying doesn't line up with what Christ said. And uh, he seemed very receptive. Uh, he, and he, but he would, I don't think he was converted, but it was much, it's very much like being in Athens uh, and being around some of the people around Jesus. We will hear you more on these things. So I will be calling you to talk to you some more was his, his response as he took some of my literature and took my phone number and information. And so we will continue to do that. But we have to be out in the marketplace. We have to be out among the multitudes. We just cannot be in the confines. This is good, this is necessary, but if this doesn't lead us out, if this doesn't lead you to people in your context and your sphere of influence, to witness, to help them understand their loss and why they're lost and why God says they're lost and how Jesus is the only solution to their lostness, then we're just having informational talks. We're not making disciples. But everything starts with, as we've been talking about the last uh, two times, and we'll try to finish this up tonight, with understanding, are you saved?
Mm-hmm. Are you saved? I, I wish I wanted to play an excerpt from a sermon yesterday I listened to, I was debating yesterday, um, that's on uh, what we just finished in Pathway to Freedom. It was his message, his first message on the first commandment. And if you listen to that message, he will tell you that he often questioned his own salvation when he reads the Bible. Because the law is a mirror, it's not a ladder. Many people see the law, the Ten Commandments, as a ladder you try to climb up, climb up, when the law is really a mirror that shows you how you look. So the more he studies the Bible, the more he questions. Because the more he looks in the mirror, the less he sees a reflection that he should be seeing. And if you're not doing that, you may be more secure than you should be. Because you're always going to fall short of the reflection that's in the mirror. Hello. And the danger is, the more you study the Bible, the more you have that sense. The less you study the Bible, the less you have that sense. So many people never examine themselves that way because there is no Bible being held up to. You all may struggle because all we do is hold up Bible to you. And so we're constantly causing you to look in the mirror. And from the pulpit to the back door, we always fall short of the reflection that's in the mirror. I challenge you to go listen to his message so you just don't think it's me. Because when I said that a couple weeks ago, some of y'all freaked out. But the more you look in the mirror, the more questions you have. Now, foundationally, we know that we're secure because of our faith in Christ. But fruit-wise, you got questions. Yes, sir. Everybody with me? Yes. Our foundation is our faith in Jesus Christ and the finished work of Jesus Christ. When you look in the mirror, that reflection is always true. But when you look at the outworking that is supposed to be produced by that foundation, when you look at the blocks that should be building your Christian life, you got questions. Well, you should have questions. And if you don't question, if you're so secure that you never question, you might be too secure. Because when you go through them Ten Commandments, that mirror, you don't look like that. Everybody with me? Everybody understand the difference? Foundationally, faith in Christ alone. Saved by faith through grace in Christ alone. But when I look at the reflection of the Christ likeness, that foundation should be building and I should be building on, there are questions. Go listen to that message yesterday, yesterday on oneplace.com. The evaluators have got questions. Because of what he's seen in the mirror doesn't look like that way in his life. We all should have questions. Now, don't let devil, the devil flip the script on you and make you doubt your salvation because your salvation is based on faith in Christ alone. But James says... There ought to be some evidence. There ought to be some evidence. And one of the major evidences is that you are being conformed, that we are being conformed, that I am being conformed to the image of Christ day by day. 
that I am a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable spiritual service, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. While at the same time, I am being transformed by the renewing of my mind so that I'm not being conformed to this world system or this world's way of thinking. <clears throat> and where is the evidence that validates that that's taking place? To where this world is becoming less and less and less and less to us. And Christ and the things of heaven and the eternal are becoming more and more and more. That is a disciple. And we'll talk more about those details because I've done some extra study outside these notes and I'll bring those notes to you as we move along. So let's, sum, let's talk about the summary of God's process of redeeming mankind through Christ to him. Salvation is a work of Christ alone, which is really, really good news. Because we mess up everything we get our hands in. Amen. I am so happy that it's what Christ has done to save me, and I have no part in it. But my sanctification, my growth, my maturity is my responsibility. And Christ's responsibility, the Holy Spirit's responsibility in a partnership. Let me read another section from his book, if I didn't lose the page. He says on page 134, Michael Horton in his book, The Gospel Commission, writers like Foster and Willard respond to a genuine crisis, namely the reduction of the gospel to fire insurance and sin management. And that's the way a lot of people think about the gospel. Writers like Foster and Willard are responding to, genu uh, to a genuine crisis in the church, namely the reduction of the gospel to fire insurance and sin management with the inner life of believers left to the distractions of a culture that prizes busyness in the world more highly than being alone with God in prayer and meditating on his word. You're going to see the connection between that in the sermon on Sunday. You are not going to have victory in the land if you don't practice these things, Joshua, and all the people. So Joshua, you practice them, but teach your people to practice them too. Because it's not just Joshua that has to go into the land. And the land is full of paganism that's going to be attracted to you if you don't practice these things. The Canaanites were in the land, and there's a whole background on the Canaanites. <laughs> Just as a side note, the Canaanites are the descendants of Canaan. Anybody know who Canaan is? Who's Canaan? Not Cain, Canaan. Ham, one of Ham's son. Was there a curse on? Now who is Ham? What is Ham's ethnic makeup? The dark. The dark. Burnt skin, dark skin. So the Canaanites were dark skinned people who were cursed by God because of their sin in Genesis. And God said he would wipe out the Canaanites. The Canaanites are eternally cursed by God. Now, fortunately, there's some other dark skinned groups that come along. <laughs> now, we want to talk about history, but we don't want to talk about history. <clears throat> The Canaanites are descendants of Canaan. Canaan was cursed because of the sin 
that he committed against his father in Genesis. Not all of Ham's descendants were cursed. I just thought I'd throw that in for you, just a little bit of background in history. That's a whole other study, but some believers have been taught that Jesus can be one's savior without being one's Lord. That's the whole thing that MacArthur has written about several times on Lordship Salvation. It caused a great controversy. There are some people who believe you can receive Jesus as Savior, not receive him as Lord, still be saved. And then somewhere down the line, mm. you decide mm. that he's Lord. The problem with that is Jesus is Lord, has always been Lord, will always be Lord, and it's not based on your decision to make him Lord whether he's Lord or not. Amen. So to receive him as Savior is to receive him as, because he is both Savior and, and that's all in his various names and titles that are used throughout the scripture. So this foolishness that MacArthur has been battling for years about is Jesus Lord at the point, point that you get saved or do you make him Lord somewhere else is answered if you just understand the scriptures and his various titles that he holds. Yes? I'm not really ready. I'm not ready to surrender all to him. I want to be saved. I want fire insurance. I want my sin managed. But I'm not willing to follow him in obedience. So, so that's also bound with me. Yeah. Well, someone's Lord, you bow to me. You bow. Yeah. Yes. So. Yes, it does if there's no truth, and my truth is the truth. Mm -hmm. If I get to reinterpret what the Bible means, it does make sense. Mm -hmm. If I get to do what, Ad, what Satan did with Adam and Eve and tried to do with Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, has God really, is this what God really means? Mm -hmm. See, this is what the guy was asking me last night. Does it still mean that? Because I took him to a several passages. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man may come to the Father by me. So that says that he's the only way. I took him to Matthew, uh, the broad road, the narrow road. I took him to Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Uh, there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. Yeah, yeah, that's what it meant then, but is that what it means now? I said, well, see, that's the wisdom of God. The original manuscripts are written in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. They are dead languages, so they are not evolving languages like our English language. So it doesn't mean something different in the five, next five minutes than it meant when it first came out. So whatever it meant then is what it means now. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and it's true. It's not just interesting, it's true. So if this is what it meant then, that's what it means because it's the words of the language is not evolving and changing every five minutes. And the Bible is very clear that even in our English translations, we see the word Lord, we see the word God, we see the word love. There are different words that mean different things and context and the original language tells you what words being used in that context. But if you don't know that and you only got one definition for love, then every time you see the word love, you make it the only definition you know that love means. Or Lord, or Rabbi, or Disciple, or... You understand what I'm saying? Yes. This is the ignorance of our modern day church society. Yet we want shorter services, no Sunday school, and shorter sermons. 
and we don't know the Bible. Let alone understand the Bible. Let alone rightly divide and apply the Bible. That's because people want fire insurance and they want their sin managed. They don't want a Lord and they don't want to be disciples. And the church has just been trying to make converts. They have not been trying to make disciples. We've been trying to get not just on our spiritual gun belt or bedposts, but we are not really making disciples if we really understood what the word disciple really meant. So therefore, there are a lot of unborn again people in our churches. Historically, for 40 to 50, the last 40, 50 years. But that's always been a problem in the church. But if you know your Bible, it's going to be a greater problem as we move towards that day. The day of Christ is coming. Some believers have been taught that Jesus can be one Savior without being one's Lord. However, this is a serious error. Discipleship is not an optional extra. See, a lot of people think discipleship is an optional extra. It, it's, it's when I really get serious. I'm a Christian, but when I really get serious, then I'll be a disciple. Hmm. The word disciple is used more in the New Testament than the word Christian is. <laughs> and it was the unsaved people at Antioch that called the Christians Christians because they reflected and looked like and talked like and spoke like and lived like that Christ God so much they called them Christians. It wasn't the same folk they saw called themselves Christians. It was the disciples often misunderstand and disobey their Lord. And that's true, we do. But they follow him. Anyway, the early disciples often misunderstood what Jesus was saying, didn't they? They often misquoted Peter leading the pack, right? But where were they? With him. With him. Who would have everybody identified them with? Jesus. Why would they have identified them with Jesus? Because they were following him. Even though they didn't always obey him correctly. Always, even though they didn't always understand what he was saying when he was teaching. Even though they didn't always rightly apply everything he taught. Everybody knew they were Christ's disciple because they followed him. They weren't following me. They weren't with Jesus and then at the Pharisee meeting. They weren't at and then at the Canaanite meeting. Or whatever they were. They were following him. And everywhere Jesus went, the lambs were sure to go. Because they were sacrificial lambs. Because Jesus, the Lamb of God, was the ultimate sacrifice. If we are followers of Christ, if we are not followers of Christ, I'm sorry, he says, we are not his disciples. That is to say, we are not merely carnal Christians. Second class believers who are saved but will lose their rewards, rather we are not Christians at all. I'm a Christian, I'm carnal. I'm a Christian, but I'm not on that disciple level yet. I'm not, he's not the Lord. I, Michael Horton said, then you're not a Christian at all. Because the Bible would say, you're not a Christian at all. But we keep redefining. Pastors keep lowering the level. You know, in the Olympics, they set records, and there are people who do high jumps 
and they set records. There would be no record if you lowered the left pole to the level where everybody could jump over. Ain't nothing special about that. Everybody looked like the Olympic star. No, you raise the standard, and then you got to train to get up over that bad boy. See, if I lower it low enough, for you ain't got to do no training. Right? If I put it down here, all of y'all be Olympic star get gold medals, right? If I raise that back up here, it's like, now go. How many of y'all getting up over? And we have lowered the standard of God's word and the meaning of God's word and the requirements of God's word and the expectation of God's word. To where everybody can say, I'm a Christian. Do you go to church regularly? Nope, I'm a Christian. Do you give to the Lord's word regularly? Nope, I'm a Christian. Do you share the gospel with anybody? Nope, but I'm a Christian. Do you practice spiritual discipline? Nope, but I'm a Christian. <coughs> I got my fire insurance. I got my free ticket. As critical as one, and I'll finish this, as critical as one might be of many aspects of monastic approach that was the uh, <coughs> nuns and the priests who lived in monasteries. The monastic approach to spirituality, we are particularly tempted in our distracted culture to ignore the daily routines of prayer and meditation on God's word. The pace of life in highly developed economies like ours threatens to squeeze out the daily habits that allow us to take, to take a step back and evaluate the things that really matter most. See, this is what Jesus was getting at in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things the Gentiles are worried about, the unsafe folk are worried about, I will supply for you. But you got to do something first. Now, get this. In spite of what you may think, God is not obligated, obligated to supply any of your needs if you're not attached to seeking first the kingdom of God. Yes. That's why in many churches, the deacons get up when I was growing up, and they would give God praise that any sinner could have got up front and gave God praise for. I could bring Gentiles, unsafe folk over here, and they can give up, sit up there and give that same testimony. What is God supernaturally doing for you that he's not doing for them yes. in common grace because you're seeking first the kingdom of God Amen. and all that goes with that? Which obviously is led by the Great Commission. pace of life, highly developed economies like ours threaten to squeeze out the daily habits that allow us to take a step back and evaluate the things that really matter most. This is even true for pastors, especially to the extent that they are CEOs and managers in their office or on their cell phones more than shepherds in their study and at the bedside. So, some year of God's process of redeeming mankind through Christ himself if it doesn't look like what God intended, then it's not what God intended. Therefore, it cannot accomplish what only God intended. Are we looking like, living like, thinking like, being conformed to that which God intended in saving us? What about your agenda has changed compared to when you were not following? What about your values has changed now that are different now than when you were not following Christ? What has changed about your stewardship of your time, talents, treasures, temple, testimony that is different now and looks different each day and each year compared to what it did the previous day or year 
as you are growing and maturing and being conformed to the image of Christ. What's changing as a result of hearing all these Sunday school lessons, all these men's fellowship Bible studies, all these women's fellowship Bible studies, all these Wednesday night Bible studies, all these sermons, what's changing that's radically different today than what it was yesterday or last year at this time? And if you're not regularly asking yourself those questions, you're not asking the right questions. I'm not asking the right questions. That's why I even ask you these questions in sermons and in Bible studies. Because the word of being saved changes you. But as a disciple, the word of God and the Holy Spirit work in your life is supposed to be changing you too. And it changes your values, your priorities. It changes why you live and what you live for. It changes what you love and what you don't love. It changes what you hate and what you don't hate. It takes you beyond what your human goodness or morality can accomplish. I also was talking about this today also, that Jesus rearranges the Pharisees' twisting of the scripture in Leviticus 19, verse 18, if I remember correctly, or 18, 19 where it says, love thy neighbor, Jesus raises up the whole knot, love your enemies. Yeah. And do good to those who despitefully misuse you. Yeah. Because anybody can love anybody that treats them right. Yeah. But how do you know you have been birthed and empowered with supernatural love that's outside of yourself? Mm -hmm. You are able to love your enemies do good to those who despitefully misuse you. That makes you radically different than a morally good person who just loves people who do good. So, no man sees God, we were all sinners. That's why all this racial stuff, cultural stuff, this cultural division, racial division, denominational division, don't make no sense. Because we all start off at the lost point. And we all get found, chosen, the same way. There is no merit about you where you deserve to be saved. There is no works that you could have done or accumulated that would have merited you to be saved. <coughs> Why? No man sees God, we're all sinners before Christ. And as I said at the conference, I think a lot of this confusion is because we don't get our titles right. Because you're not a sinner title-wise as a Christian. You're a saint. Because what the Bible says a sinner is, you no longer are. A sinner is in the kingdom and the realm of darkness. Right? A saint is in the realm of light. It's not the same. You were dead in sins and trespasses at one point, but now you have been what? Ephesians chapter 2, made alive and it's not the same. You were not seeking God over here. You seek now the kingdom of God and God over here. It's not the same. And if your mind is not aligned rightly with truth, you think you can be over here, then guess what? You're going to be over here. Claiming you're over here. Anybody with me? Yes. Now, we're sinners who have been saved by grace. But as a saint, you are no longer the title of a sinner. 
And this is, this is clear in illustrations that Paul uses, that Jesus uses in Scripture. Paul says, I have betrothed you to Christ. I have betrothed you to Christ. I have married you to Christ. Right? In the Bible, who's the groom? Say it like I mean it. Y'all scared? Who's the groom? In the Bible, who's the bride? The church. Now, last time I checked, the bride takes the name of the groom. <laughs> How you married to Christ and you still got your old name from your old lover? Mm. Anybody with me? Mm. You, you don't have any identification with that old marriage covenant with sin and death and Satan. Romans chapter 7 talks about this. Let's go to Romans chapter 7. So y'all don't think I'm making this stuff up. Somebody read for us Romans chapter 7. Verse 1 through 6. For do you not know, brethren, why I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who who, as a husband, is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. For if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if, while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. If her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, sinful passions, which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the law. So is that, is, is that hard for anybody to understand? He uses the analogy of marriage to talk about our spiritual relationship with Christ. We die to the old mate, the old spouse, the law. But we have been betrothed to Christ. Therefore, we have no allegiance to the old spouse. All our allegiance is now with the new spouse. But if the old spouse still lives and you marry another, you commit adultery. So it is with the law and grace. You can't have dual affiliation. You die to one, you divorce one, you're married to the other. We're married to Christ now. We've been betrothed to Christ. But when the flesh, therefore, when the flesh, verse 4, therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. There's, there's a radical change, brothers and sisters. There's a whole new reality and relationship that produces a whole kind of different fruitfulness of life. This was not true while we were all sinners. All of us, number two, all of us, including the Jews in Christ today, rejected him. At one point, we all are guilty of rejecting Christ. When we were betrothed to the law, when we were betrothed to sin, when we were betrothed to spiritual death. 
but when you got new birth, when you were made alive in Christ Jesus, when you were betrothed to Christ, because you are now divorced from Satan and the law and death, something radically changes. Not just in your position, but also reflected in your practice. Everybody with me? Any questions? Jesus, through his death, provided salvation to all mankind. It's available to all. But all will not respond to what Christ has done. And they won't know if we don't go tell them that Christ has done something. That's the work of the church. That's the work of the body. That's the work of the ambassadors and disciples of Christ. We go tell them what Christ has done on their behalf. Now, they may respond or they may reject. But let's not let it be because we didn't tell them. We did not choose God. He chose us. We don't even need to rehash that. We've been talking about the last two weeks, right? Because he so loved us. His love was the motivation in choosing us. There was no merit. There was nothing about us that says we were worthy of being choose or that he had to choose us or that he better choose us or that he should choose us. He just decided to display his love and unveil his love to us. Salvation becomes available when the Holy Spirit causes us to accept that we are a sinner in need of forgiveness provided only through Christ. Now, people don't come to the realization on their own that they're sinners. They have, need to understand they're breaking a standard. There has to be a standard. The Ten Commandments gives us that standard. But also the Holy Spirit is also, if you read Romans chapter 1 and some other, is also letting them know in their conscience every day that they're in violation. But rather than repent, they get angry. Their hearts become hard. They realign the truth. They do whatever is necessary not to respond. Not to admit that God is true and right and they're wrong. Because there is an enemy that has them and does not want to let them go. And that's why it's not enough for us to go out with the right message if we don't go out in power. Because they are prisoners of the law. They are prisoners of sin and death. They are prisoners of Satan. And they are children and followers of Satan. And you're not breaking that bondage that they're in just with the message and there's no power. No power working on them, and no power working to you or me. Any questions? Salvation means that once our sins are forgiven and we are in Christ, Romans 6, 1 to 5, Colossians 3, 1 to 2, we are not willing to live in submission to him so that we can stand practically pure before him through the observance of his word. Joshua, go in and take the land. But also, Joshua, before you go in and take the land, and while you're in taking the land, and when you set up house in the land, do not let the words of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on them day and night, night and day. See, when you are transformed by the Word of God, when we are transformed by the Spirit of God, when we are transformed by the love of God, we are now willing to live in submission to Him so that we can stand practically pure before him through the observance of his word. We don't want to read the word. You know, and if you're not reading it, you're not meditating. 
And if you're not meditating, you're not applying. And then we wonder why we're not winning battles with sin, death, and Satan in the land. In our human flesh. Why the enemies appear to be stronger than we are. We got all this armor. We got Christ sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding on our behalf. We got the Holy Spirit interceding on our behalf. We got the Holy Spirit indwelling us. We got the Holy Spirit filling us. We got the Word of God. We got this army of Scripture to use for whatever weaponry that Satan throws at us. We got the soon returning coming of Christ that we're anticipating. And nobody can tell. And when the tests come, we act like we don't remember what we learned. When temptation comes, we don't even know. I'm not, I'm not saying that no one misses. I'm talking about what's habitually going on. We are not habitually demonstrating that we are victors because we are bit bought into the reality of our culture that we are victims. Nothing's my fault. I'm not responsible. The devil made me do it. He can't make you do anything. Spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. You don't even know what that earth means. And we just got excuses that we think God says, I understand. He doesn't. See, when, he, when you know what you supply for someone's success, you can't Get the faith. Now, we have an intercessor, Jesus Christ, sitting right, who helps the Father understand what we're going through. But that's different than him trying to explain why they felt, Father. We, I'm abiding in them, and you abide in them. The Spirit is abiding in them. They got the word. They got the armor. They got the helmet. They got the breastplate. They got the belt. They got the shield. They got the feet shot. They got the body. They got the spiritual gifts. They got the one another. Yeah, we, we, Father, I understand. David defeated Goliath with a slingshot. They can't win nothing with all that stuff we gave. <laughs> now, I understand God was the one who was directing the rock to the right places that was vulnerable in Goliath. But he does the same thing for us in our spiritual walk, in our battle against flesh and sin in this world system. But you can't win a battle if you keep surrendering to the enemy. See, we don't want to fight. We don't want to prepare to fight. And we think God understands. And I'm here to tell you, based on the scriptures, not based on my, he does not. He's gracious, he's merciful, he's long-suffering, long but that's different than him accepting it. If he accepted it, why would we lose rewards when we get to heaven? Why will there be some who make it in and smell like fire? And everybody would know that's the one who barely made it in. How do you know? They smell like smoke. Pastors who will be crownless pastors because they weren't faithful pastors. And everybody knows because the scripture says that a faithful shepherd will get a crown. And if you're a shepherd and you don't have a crown, what's everybody going to know about you in heaven? You weren't faithful. There are crowns that you and I as believers get as being believers. What are people going to know when you don't have the crown? If it doesn't matter, why does God do that?
But we're like children sometimes. I'm like a child sometimes. We get away with it so much, we think God accepts it. Because he's long-suffering, he's patient, he's loving, he's kind. That's different than him accepting it. The text in Titus 2.14 says, Who gave himself for us that we, he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people of his own possession, zealous for good deeds. That's what's the work of the Spirit. That's what the work of Christ is designed to produce in those who have experienced salvation and are growing and maturing into the image of Christ. People zealous for good works. And the modern day church, the modern day people who make up our churches are not zealous for good works. I'm talking about the kind of zeal Paul had when he was unsaved to go out and persecute the church. That he kept that same zeal to build the church. See, if all of us were to take time to reflect back to our unsaved lives, we had some zeal about some stuff. Are we, do I, do you, reflect that same zeal for the things of God. When you was unsaved, you run all night. Get saved, can't function out sleep. <laughs> unsaved, work yourself to death trying to make some money. Get saved will not work yourself to death to make disciples. Share the gospel. Use your spiritual gift to build up the body. This is where we are in our modern church. I'm here to tell you that's not God's church. He's the designer. He's the architect. He came up with the plans. He came up with the strategy. It's his household. Definition of repentance. Repentance means to turn around, to change one's direction, and go another way. That's the biblical definition of repentance. The verb in the Greek, this is some extra work that I did, the word, I'll spell it for you, M-E-T-A-N-O-E with a hyphen over the E, S-A-T-E. That's the Greek word for the word repentance. M-E-T-A-N-O-E -E with a hyphen over it, S-A-T-E. Means change your outlook or have a change of heart. Reverse the direction of your life. That's repentance. And in the modern day church, many people feel like they can say they got saved and continue down the same path that we're going, and the only difference is what they say and the fact that they may go to church regularly. But there's no real repentance. There's no change of mind. There's no change of outlook. There's no change of values and priorities. There's no change of direction. And without repentance, there's no salvation. Without repentance, there's no sanctification. This obviously results in a change of conduct, but the emphasis is on the mind and the outlook. You see life through Christ's eyes. You see life through biblical definitions. You see life from a kingdom of God, rule of God perspective. This is what we mean when we say conversion. Matthew 18 and 3, and I looked those up and did some word studies on that. John 12, 40, Acts 15, 3. The Greek word, I'll spell for you again, for conversion is E-P-I-S, 
T-R-O, P-H-E, epistrophe, E-P-I-S-T-R-O, P-H-E, E with a hyphen over it. Means conversion, means change, radical change. Something was this, it was converted, or there was a conversion, and now it's this. It's what 2 Corinthians 5 would say, we are new creations in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. Or have been converted. Your mind is converted. Your heart is converted. Your inward man is converted. The direction of your life demonstrates that you are converted. The values of your life demonstrate you are converted. The priorities of your life demonstrate you are converted. If you're converted. And so each day we are to look more converted. You know we were converted at one point in time, but there are things in our life that have to be converted to the point in time converted. So our values change, our priorities change. What, what we long for, what we lust for, what we love changes. And it should look di more different today than it did yesterday, and more different this year than it did last year, and more different next year than it did 10 years ago. <coughs> that should, that they should repent and turn to God performing deeds appropriate to repentance. When did you, when did I, when do we begin to perform the deeds that give validation and evidence to repentance? And what are those deeds? And the Bible has a list of them. First uh, John would give 11 evidences. You confess your sin. You weren't confessing your sin before you got saved. You might have felt bad about it. You might have hoped you didn't get caught. But you wouldn't confess it in a sin. You were saying, I'm only human. Ain't nobody perfect. Oops. I made a mistake. You weren't calling it what God called it before you got saved. The first John says one of the evidences that we have fellowship with God, just like the early believers have fellowship with God, is that we confess our sins. That you love your brother as God had loved you. That you're growing, chapter 2. That you have a hunger and a thirst that is unquenchable for the word of God and the things of God and communion with God. that leads to conversion and then there's a repentance that is part of sanctification. Okay. Okay. Say that again. There's a repentance that leads to conversion and then there's a repentance that is a part of the process of sanctification. So you have to change your mind about Christ to be converted. See, in the Bible, they had to change their mind about who Christ was to be converted. Because what they thought Christ was before the conversion didn't line up with who he was. The Jew had to change their mind about who Christ was because they thought Christ was a criminal. He was not the Messiah. But when they're in Acts, 
to be converted, they had to repent and be baptized, which means they had to change their mind about Christ, their outlook on Christ, their view of Christ. That's repentance. Does that make sense to anybody? Yeah, I, okay, so let me, let me ask the part you can do. Okay. Um, so say, say someone who has been sex and is causing a sin, but they haven't repented, so they haven't turned away from that. So put that in that context. Okay. Well, see, that's why First John says it's a question. See, now you're making it something a question. It's supposed to be a period. <laughs> see, what happens when you're not repenting, right. when you say you've repented for okay. salvation, okay. but you're not repenting in sanctification, you make something that's supposed to be a period, a question mark. All right. Okay. Okay, that works. For me. That works? See, salvation should be a period, not a question mark. Right. But when there's no evidence of repentance in sanctification, there's a question about repentance when it comes to conversion. Mm -hmm. okay. When it's habitually not repentance. Because we all miss the mark at points of time. But when it's habitual, right. okay. then now what should be a period as a result of your conversion becomes a question mark. And that's the whole book of 1 John. Because people were saying this, but then John would come right back and say, but you're not doing the works that are evident of you having fellowship with God or Christ, like the early apostles and disciples had. So now it's a question. That's the whole book of 1 John. You say you converted. I got questions. Because you don't confess your sins, you don't love your brother, you don't obey Christ to the point of, you don't reflect the obedience of Christ. Question about whether you really have true fellowship with Christ. It should be a period, not a question. See, how we live gives validation. This is, the, this is the difference between what Paul is saying in Romans about faith and what James is saying about faith in James. James says, let me see your works, and then I'll tell you whether you have true saving faith. Paul says you're all saved by faith and faith alone. The two go together and complement each other. They're not opposites. One is how you get saved. One is the result of you being saved. True saving faith should produce true saving works. That's what James is saying. Paul says, here's how we deal with the root of your problem. James says, here's the fruit that comes from the root being dealt with. Does that make sense? And the fruit might be tiny baby fruit, but it should look like the fruit. But it can't stay tiny baby fruit because it's supposed to mature and grow. To the point people want to take a bite of it because it's so big and juicy. People want to be a part of your life because of the fruit that you produce. Or some will reject you because of the fruit you produce. It can have that dual effect. But it can't have no effect. make sense? There's no such thing as being a Christian to have no effect. You, 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 you either thought Jesus was a liar, a lunatic, or Lord, but you weren't indifferent to him. Therefore, people can't be indifferent to us. They either got to think we're liars, lunatic, or that Jesus is Lord. But they just shouldn't be able to ignore you. 
They shouldn't be, you shouldn't be so common in their lives. They're like what Pastor Strong shared with me when we were talking about how what, what he's experiencing as he's going. People drive by this building, don't even know it's here. Because it's just a part of the scene. We shouldn't be like that in people's lives that we have relationships with and that we come in contact with every day. You're either a liar, a lunatic, or Jesus is really Lord. That should be their view. Because that was their view of Jesus. That was their view of the disciples. That was their view of the apostles. That was their view of the Old Testament prophets. But no effect? No. This is why it is explained above this. This is why it is explained above that salvation takes place when a person sincerely believes in their heart, their inner man. Their belief is a sincere conviction because it is through faith, which means the Holy Spirit is drawing them to God. See, salvation is a work of God. So therefore, since God does the work, it has to produce what God intended. See, if we were saving ourselves, then we could come up with what it should look like. But if God does the saving and the Holy Spirit does the work, then it's got to bear what it's intended to bear. Or it's not the real deal. Through faith, which means the Holy Spirit is drawing them to God. See, we're chosen. How are you chosen and don't look like what you're chosen for? By the one you were chosen for, from? Or by? How does that happen? I mean, even us as fallen humans, produce children that have characteristics of the person that they came out of. How we come out of Christ, come out of God, we don't have his characteristics. It's a birth, ain't it? You mean humans can produce lookalikes, but God can't? And we're marred by sin. He's not. This is why all these illustrations and analogies are so important in the Bible. You have to bring them out because we don't get a full understanding. It is faith that comes from God to us. Faith that comes from God. So the faith we have to believe is not something we manifest. It's something that God gives us. So if God gives it, it has to be authentic. It has to produce what it's designed to produce. This is why salvation is a gift from God. Nobody earns it. Nobody deserves it. It's a gift. And it's a free gift. When an unbeliever is repentant, God will grant them salvation. But they must repent. Change your mind, change your worldview, change of outlook, change of agenda, change your priorities, change your values, change. And it's a radical change. And the more you teach them, and the more the Holy Spirit is working in them as they're being taught, the more that change becomes evident. The act of repentance leads to an unbeliever experiencing eternal life. Eternal life is not something you're waiting to get. Eternal life is something that you're granted the moment you are born again. You didn't have life. Now you have life. Abundantly. Eternal life. And it's a different kind of life than what you had before you had this life. Repentance was Christ's primary mission on earth. Jesus preached about repentance all the time. John the Baptist preached about repentance. You viper, you, you dead, why, who told you to run out here and flee? Repent. 
Repenting was a huge message in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's just not a big message in the church today. We're saying come as you are. Stay as you are. We ain't saying repent. Salvation, therefore, is impossible without repentance. Salvation is therefore impossible without repentance. We'll stop there. Any questions? Anything confusing? Anything I want I want to be clear on this. 